And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two (coughs) commandments. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So uh, you'll see in your bulletin that um, Pastor Bill was actually supposed to preach today. And, um, and he um, threw his back out last night, and so I'm standing in, which I think is one of the benefits of serving in a church where you have multiple pastors. The caveat is that I've been fighting a really bad cough all week, so we're going to pray right now that I just don't cough for the next however many minutes. If I do, Beth is going to turn off the, th- the mic so you don't have to hear it in the speaker's. And then Dwight's going to come up and finish the sermon. So we have a plan if it happens, but we're going to pray that it doesn't happen. Okay, so will you join me in prayer? Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning around my coughing. Help us to hear you speak to us. God, because we believe that you are our rock and our foundation. Amen. So for the past few weeks, we have been um, preaching about the Bible. We've been trying to give you the kind of 30,000-foot view, the big picture, the overview of the whole Bible, with just a few weeks spent in closer look at certain areas that people really uh, ask a lot of questions about or struggle with. So we've talked about how the Bible was written. We've done a whirlwind overview of the themes and genres in both the Old and New Testaments. We've talked about why the Bible was written and how we should read it. We've talked about suffering and violence in Scripture and what it says about God and God's people. And last week, we talked about science and how we can believe both in evolution and in the creation stories that we find in Scripture. If you've missed any of those sermons, we invite you to go back and look at them on our website, EpworthAlive.com. I think that you'll find lots of really good information packed into just a few quick sermons. So today we finish up this series by talking about what it means to be people whose lives are shaped by the Bible. But before we do that, I'm going to ask us to do a little activity. So what I want you to do, and everybody has to do this because otherwise the people who do will feel really dumb. So your job is to not make your neighbor feel dumb. So I want you to take one of your hands and point it up towards the ceiling like you're pointing at the clouds. And I want you to look up at your hand, look up at the ceiling, and move your hand in a clockwise manner. I'm not going to look to see if you're doing it. I'm just going to hope that you are. So move it in clockwise manner. And then very slowly move your hand back down. And look at your hand. What direction is it moving now? Counterclockwise. Is your mind blown yet? The trick is you have, to, you have to look up to do it, otherwise I was practicing it last night. You have to look at the first circle in order to do it. People are going to be doing this the whole rest of the service, trying to get it to work. So the question is what changed? Why is it that when you start at the beginning, your hand is going clockwise, and by the time you get it down under your chin, it's going counterclockwise? Anybody know why? Your perspective has changed. Excellent your perspective. We live in a culture and society that often has this perspective, right? Everybody needs to go in the same direction clockwise. And the Bible looks at things from this perspective, asking us to go countercultural, to go counterclockwise. Not only does the Bible call us to look at things from that perspective, but it calls us to live from that perspective. And if we are going to live from that perspective in a world where the current is going this way and we have to go that way, it takes a lot of intentionality and effort. In many ways, the entire overarching story of the Bible can be summed up in our scripture passages this morning. For God so loved the world that God gave God gave. And the Bible is filled with story after story, example after example of what God has given us. The Bible starts by telling us that God gave us life, life and this world and everything in it. And God saw that it was good. God saw that it was not good for us to be alone. And so God gave us one another. God gave us the gift of being made in God's image, the ability to choose between good and evil, to create and to destroy, to laugh and hope and dream, to feel compassion and pain and sorrow and everything in between. 
God gave us structure and rules to help us figure out how to live in a way that helps us become the best version of ourselves, of who he created us to be. But God also gave us the freedom to choose if we were going to live within that structure or not. When we fell short, when we chose to live another way, God gave us the chance after chance to turn back. God gave us judges and prophets to lead us back to the right path. And God gave us a system of sacrifices that invited us constantly back into communion and relationship with God and one another. When we chose to turn back, God offered us forgiveness and another chance. And then when we got confused, thinking that sacrifices were what God wanted, that we could do whatever we wanted as long as we offered the appropriate sacrifices afterwards, God didn't demand more of us or simply write us off. Instead, God gave even more of God's self. God gave his son, Jesus, that we would have life, true, abundant life. While Jesus was with the disciples, he gave us the gift of miracles and healings. He gave us stories and parables and teachings, all of which were designed to help us see from this perspective, to help us understand what God wants of us and what God's kingdom really looks like. And Jesus gave us his life as a way of reconnecting us with God, of offering us forgiveness and another way to live. Jesus gave us his life, and in doing so, gave us the assurance that death is never the end, that nothing at all can separate us from God, that God really is more powerful than anything we encounter in this life. And after Jesus returned to heaven, scripture tells us that God gave again. God gave us the Holy Spirit, once again pouring himself out on us in a new way. In that process, God also gave us a new community, the church, a community of people seeking to live as Jesus did and to invite others into relationship with God. God gave and gave and gave, and because of God's love for us, God continues to give and give and give. And as people who are made in the image of God, we are invited to be people who give as well. If we want to be people who are shaped by the Bible, we will be people who give. Others will say of us, for you so loved God that you gave. But Jesus did not give as the world gives, and we are to follow suit. When we think of giving, we usually jump first to money and monetary material gifts. And to be sure, God asks us to give of our money, and there are thousands of passages in the Bible that refer to our money and how we are to spend it. Let me just stop for a second. I was in the... Um, hair salon, getting my new fancy Amira hairdo the other day. And I was listening as the girl was shampooing my hair, and there was a, a woman talking to her stylist, and I heard, they were talking about money, and I heard her say, um, for the root of, um, money is the root of all evil. I just want to make sure my Epworth folks know that scripture actually says the love of money is the root of all evil. So if I'm in the hair salon and I hear you say that, I will stop you. <laughs> just so you know. It's the love of money is the root of all evil. But God asks us so much more of us than that, right? God asks us to give of our time, to be willing to stop and listen and care for others along our path. We're asked to give of our energy. We're asked to give forgiveness, even when we don't want to, for little easy things and for big, huge things that are really hard. We're asked to give compassion and hope when other people choose not to, to offer support and encouragement, to bear with one another our burdens, and to share our knowledge with each other. Jesus says these strange things in the Gospels, like blessed are the poor, and blessed are those who mourn, and blessed are the meek, and blessed are the peacemakers, and blessed are the merciful. We're often, I think, left to wonder, based on that description, what it really means to be blessed, because we certainly don't use it the way that Jesus uses it in Scripture. Are we being a blessing to the people that Jesus calls blessed? Are we being a blessing to the poor? As we seek to be shaped by the Bible, I want to give you a few practical suggestions, ways that you can take the strange things that Jesus says in the gospel and live them out in your lives. These are ways that I think you can really read the Bible for all it's worth as we entitled our sermon series. There are things that I use in my own personal life and in ministry life when I'm teaching Bible study, ways that help me to hear God's truth in scripture. If you want a pencil to write them down, you can, or we'll um, send them out in e-blast for you so you remember them. The first practical way I think that helps us to read the Bible for all it's worth is to read your Bible, right? That seems kind of obvious, 
but I still think we have to say it out loud. You will be surprised by the number of people who have come to church for a long, long time but never pulled out the Bible to read it for themselves, or those who read it long ago but haven't looked at it since. If you want to be shaped by the Bible, we need to be continually reading it. And not just a superficial reading with the assumption that you already know the stories or you already know what it says, because as we learned last week, sometimes we miss things like two creation stories in the book of Genesis. We have to be really reading attentively, carefully, and we have to be reading it expecting that you will hear something new. The second tip I have for you is to try to see yourself in the story. Sometimes when I am reading a story, I will ask myself, which of these characters would I be? Which character in the story is like me? Who can I relate to in my own life? Sometimes that person is the one you expect it to be the least. And then I ask myself a second question. Who can I not relate to? Who do I not understand? And why don't I understand what they do? I think both of those questions help you to get a little bit of a different perspective in the story. The third practical tip I have for you is to discover the situation in which the scripture was written. There are many ways that you can do that. If you have a good study Bible, you can read the introduction to whatever um, book you're reading, 1 Samuel or the Gospel of John. Study Bibles will have an introduction at the beginning of each book. Um, you can look in the margins and they'll give you all kinds of information. If you, um, if you don't have a good study Bible and want a suggestion, please just let us know. We'll be happy to provide you with a, a list of ones that we think are really good. And if you have a really good one, share it with us in case that's not on our list. Doing all of that, looking at the how and when and where and uh, why and by whom a particular passage was written helps you to understand it in the context that it was given for the original hearers, which then helps you to relate it to your life a little better. The fourth tip I have for you is to ask three questions. Ask yourself, what does this scripture teach me about humanity? What does this scripture teach me about myself? And what does this scripture teach me about God? Use those questions to reflect. Maybe you want to write them in a journal or talk to a family member or a friend about them or email your pastors. We'd be happy to have those conversations with you. Those three questions help you to really look at what the scripture um, writers were trying to tell you, what you can discover um, about God and humanity within them. The fifth tip I have for you is to pray the scripture. I think this particular one works well with smaller passages with just a verse or two or three, and you can do it in a couple of ways. In our Thursday night Bible study class, we've been practicing um, something called Lexia Divina, which means divine reading. And what we do is we read the passage through once, usually aloud, to help your brain get used to the words within the passage. And then we read it and pray it a second time, asking God to speak to us. And then we read and pray it a third time, asking, uh, listening for a word or a phrase that sticks out to you. And then spend a couple minutes in silence thinking about what that word has to do with your life, how it connects to you. Do it over and over and over again. Not a hurried two-minute reading where you look at it quickly and try to find a word, but maybe um, 20, 15, 20 minutes or so. The more that you do it, the more you will see how the scripture passage connects with um, something that's going on in your life right now. You could also choose to read it line by line. For example, if you're reading Romans 12, uh, 1 through 2, which says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You could take those two verses and then pray them line by line, saying something like, God, help me to live these words of Paul. Help me to give my entire body to you as a sacrifice. I pray that in what I do and say that you might be glorified. Help me not to conform to this world, but to let you change and transform my mind. Both of those ways, I think, are great ways to pray scripture. And if you let them, if you do them enough, they will transform you. My sixth tip is to memorize scripture. Now, anybody at Epworth who's been in Bible study with me over the last two and a half years will tell you I am a horrible scripture memorizer. I'm, it's just not, I'm not good at it, which as a pastor, I don't know what that says about me, but I'm not. 
I do think that it's helpful, though. And what I usually tell people is, even if I can't tell you the chapter and verse, I can usually tell you whether or not it's in there and where, in general, it is. And I think what's helpful about memorizing scripture is because then later, when you're having um, a moment where you need to connect with God, these words will float to your consciousness. They will be in your mind when you need them most. You don't have to get hung up on the exact wording or even necessarily on the chapter and verse, but know the words, know what God is trying to say to you through them. My last suggestion is to study scripture with others. I think it's important that we do this with one another because we learn different perspectives. We learn about ourselves and we learn about one another. We learn about the way that God works through each of us in individual ways. And it helps us to keep from seeing scripture in our own myopic lens, to help us from seeing it only the way we want to see and understand it. There are lots of opportunities at Epworth to do this. You can um, come to the um, Sunday school class that meets at 915 downstairs. that Arun helps to facilitate. You can come to our Thursday night Bible study group or our Sunday night at 6 p.m. Bible study group where you can join um, the young adults who will take you, even if you are not a young adult, who meet now on Wednesdays at 7, right? Yeah. Uh, And join us any one of those times. You're welcome to pop in. If those don't work for you, you can ask one of us and we will be happy to set up a Bible study at a different time. We think it's that important that you get in that we will reschedule whatever we have to. At Epworth, we have a tradition of giving Bibles to our third graders and then again to our confirmation students. It's a great tradition, I think. When we give out Bibles, though, I want us to remember that we aren't just handing out a book. We really are giving the stories of our faith. We are giving them the story of how God has interacted with human history, the story that God created each of us to be special. We give the story that God has a purpose and plan for you. We give the story of how God forgives each of us when we fall short of what God intends for us. We give the story of how God sustains us in the midst of an often difficult and confusing life. Some will look at the scripture at Bible and tell you that it is a book of answers, and in many ways it is, but I think it is just as much a book of questions, questions that invite you into a conversation about our faith, about God, about what it means to live as a disciple of Christ in this confusing world. When we give the gift of a Bible, the real gift is that we invite them to journey with us through the story of faith. The greatest gift we can give to one another is to be a community that is shaped by the Bible, to be a community that knows the Bible's stories and has learned its words, to be a community earnestly seeking to live out the Bible's values and principles, and that is lovingly inviting others along with us on this journey, to be a community that trusts in God, that remembers the works of God, and that earnestly seeks to be obedient to God. Friends, let's be that gift for one another. So if you've never taken a Bible study before, I invite you to make this be the year that you try it. If it's been a while since you've been in a group study, make this be the year that you join one again. If you're worried that you don't know enough to go to a Bible study, let me assure you that that is not true. Everybody else thinks the same thing. Bible study is for those who are smart enough to know that there is still more for them to learn, more that they don't know. Whether you've never opened it or you read it every day, we invite you to join us. No one in class will judge you. Instead, everyone is there to help each other learn and to ask questions of one another. Being shaped by the Bible is hard work, and it takes intentional effort for us to swim countercultural to what the world tells us to do. But it is not an impossible task. Let's not only give that gift to our children as we give them Bibles each year, but let's also give that each other that gift, the gift of a community that is shaped and formed by the Bible. For God so loved the world that God gave. May we so love God that we also give. The words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us stand together and join in praying our prayer with one voice. Holy and gracious God, so often we look at ourselves, our gifts, and our talents and wonder what you would do with these offerings. We sometimes think that we do not have much to give. Far too many times 
we belittle the gifts you've given us and turn our backs on the needs and opportunities to serve, believing that our gifts, our stories, cannot possibly make a difference. Too often we live our lives the way we want instead of the way you want. Help us to live lives shaped like a cross, offering our lives and ourselves to you and to your world. Help us to bring our lives just as they are to you and to receive your gentle touch and healing grace. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.